Hi, the subject of this talk is autonomy challenges for multi-spacecraft exploration of interstellar objects and long period comets. I'm Nikhil Ranganathan. This work is a collaboration between the uh, Aerospace Robotics and Control Lab at Caltech and the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. In this talk, I'm going to discuss the motivation for interstellar object, or ISO, and long period comet, or LPC, science and exploration efforts. I'm going to describe some multi-agent architectures and agile science methodologies for ISO LPC exploration and give some results on autonomous science planning in the context of ISO LPC missions. So the interest in studying um, ISOs and LPCs has been accentuated over the past couple of years by the discoveries of the first two interstellar objects, so namely Oumuamua and Borisov, uh, interstellar objects and long period comets have the uniting characteristic that they're considered once in a lifetime objects. So uh, once they pass inside of the vicinity of Earth and leave, there's not a future opportunity to explore them. For interstellar objects uh, defined by their hyperbolic orbits, they provide insight into the composition of other solar systems and evidence for mechanisms for dynamical ejection from other solar systems. For long period comets, uh, these objects, since they originate in the Oort cloud, have preserved most of their original volatile content and um, uh, are essentially snapshots of the early solar system. So they would provide insight into the composition of the protoplanetary disk. These objects present some unique challenges to any potential exploration mission owing mostly due to their orbits. So, Sort of by definition, their orbits are highly eccentric, resulting in high relative velocities uh, for a, um, a flyby mission in the range of, of 10 to upwards of 50 kilometers per second, where the um, upper bound is more the maximum that our instrumentation could probably handle. And in reality, it could be much higher than that. They're also hard to track. And so their unpredictable occurrence necessitates a rapid response type of, of um, architecture, since there's not a lot of time between discovery and when a launch would have to happen. Also, their high inclinations preclude a rendezvous mission, so we instead have to resort to short flybys um, on the duration of hours, which make conducting science hard. And on top of that, in the case of a, of a long period comet, we have to contend with debris and outgassing. So in 2018, the Keck Institute of Space Studies um, organized a workshop uh, to address these challenges. The key takeaways from the workshop was that multi-spacecraft architectures with heterogeneous capabilities and infused onboard autonomy are a potential solution to explore these classes of objects. And I'll explain the reasons for that in a little bit. Also, uh, as demonstrated in the pork shop plot on the right, the percentage of accessible interstellar objects and long period comets is highly constrained by the available energy on launch, the encounter velocity, and the, the um, discovery um, lead time. And so any potential mission has to account uh, for a potentially high relative velocity and um, a short development time. So with the motivation in hand, uh, what do multi-agent architectures for ISO LPC exploration actually um, look like. So we might envision an architecture that looks uh, as pictured. So potentially a parent spacecraft that uh, functions as a relay to Earth that can deploy a fleet of smaller spacecraft with heterogeneous capabilities in a sequential fashion relative to the object. So for example, a scout spacecraft might be sent 10 or so hours ahead of the parent spacecraft in order to fix the orbital elements and, and um, uh, characterize the rotational state of the object and the dust distribution. Um, and that information would then get passed down onto uh, follow-on instrumentation spacecrafts such as imagers or potentially an impactor in the case of an ISO to expose a fresh cloud of volatiles or potentially um, spacecraft to perform in situ sample collection and analysis. Um, so this type of architecture would inevitably add complexity to a mission. So why multi-spacecraft? What's the, the justification? 
for a couple of reasons. First is that although a single spacecraft may only be able to encounter the object for an hour or two, uh, a sequential flyby architecture could extend the functional observation window for the whole mission to perhaps 12 hours to a day. Also, uh, the decentralized architecture that's inherent in a multi-spacecraft architecture would, it, which inter would introduce a, uh, a block redundancy to the mission that would reduce risk due to instrument failure or a debris impact. Also, uh, small spacecraft architectures allow us to utilize more commercial off-the-shelf components, which can help contend with the lack of a um, large development time. And also, uh, multi-spacecraft architectures could potentially enable entirely new observation methods like a biostatic radar. So uh, what is more specifically the case for autonomy in such a mission? To understand this question, we consider the primary drivers and secondary drivers for both uh, a long period comet mission and an ISO mission um, separately. So for uh, a long period comet, the primary drivers have more to do with cooperation between the multiple assets and potential communication delay if the, uh, if the flyby occurs in deep space. Uh, and secondary to that is the optimization of the operations under a short encounter window. Uh, this is because a long period comet, or I guess um, a comet in general, has a tail that's much easier to track. And so the observation window is uh, relatively longer in comparison to an ISO, which is hard to, to track and hard to observe. And so the observation windows are much more condensed, requiring an optimization-based approach to the science. For an ISO, we might also consider an autonomous impactor, which would require more autonomy um, from a navigation perspective. So uh, this talk is going to focus more on how to optimize operations under a small encounter window, but there are other reasons why doing onboard science planning is helpful. First is that onboard ops or, uh, observations from the ground are probably going to be insufficient to determine regions of scientific interest, so those would have to be done online. Also, including the ground in the loop um, would significantly reduce the available observation window since we're talking about um, observation times of only an hour or two hours potentially. Uh, also, it would enable a reactive response to temporally sensitive phenomenon like uh, plumes. So more specifically, uh, what would an agile science approach for um, an ISO or LVC flyby uh, actually include? So there are a couple things that could be detected online. For example, plumes and, um, and outgassing there have been algorithms that have uh, been studied in the literature to autonomously detect uh, plumes and outgassing. Uh, we might also consider spectral outliers or just regions of interesting spectra. And there have been missions uh, that have already been flown, such as Earth Observing 1, um, that have successfully detected uh, thermal or spectral anomalies. Also, scientists might be interested in particular surface morphologies, and there have been algorithms developed to uh, uh, to perform surface feature detection um, that have been applied to comets and asteroids in the past. So the remaining question is now that we can map our science requirements to uh, onboard target analysis, how do you actually perform the, uh, the observations in a uh, optimal fashion with minimal computation time? So that's the focus of the rest of the talk. So the goal in optimization-based agile science is to maximize the science obtained during a sequence of short flybys. So we might consider a data flow that looks as follows. The uh, sequence is given an initial target set that's determined by either observations from the ground or just um, targets that are chosen to incentivize uh, coverage. But these would be fed into a visibility prediction module uh, that would compute uh, all, the, all the regions and time in which these targets are, are visible to the spacecraft. And then these regions would then be fed into an optimization-based observation planning tool that would schedule the operations optimally. These would then get executed. The data would get uh, analyzed on board for two reasons. First is so that the targets can be refined or new targets could be added. And uh, uh, the analysis could be then leveraged in an optimization-based downlink planner to downlink the most high-priority data first. So mathematically, we can formulate um, this uh, uh, optimal observation planning either, um, algorithm as follows. The inputs would be the target set determined as explained before, a matrix of setup times 
that would include the instrument slew time in between each target and the instrument setup times, uh, fixed observation durations and target priorities. Uh, those priorities would be set by both the top uh, top down science priorities and by the confidence in the image processing algorithms. And lastly, the set of feasible observation windows computed via uh, simulation. So the outputs would be indicator variables that say if a particular observation interval has been uh, selected for, um, for observation and also the target observation times for each target. And it turns out that this problem can be efficiently posed as a mixed integer linear programming problem or a MILP uh, problem with uh, objective function that's just the sum or, um, or the weighted sum of the chosen targets for observation subject to a couple constraints. So first is that we only want to reward a target for observation um, a single time, although this can be relaxed. Also, each observation must obviously fit within um, a, a viable observation window. And, um, and lastly, each observation must be sufficiently disjoint to allow for a sufficient transition time. It turns out that this particular constraint uh, requires the addition of an implicit uh, decision variable that scales n squared in the number of targets, and that will become important um, in a little bit. So to test this algorithm, we considered a, uh, an example observation of Borisov at the ecliptic where the body rotation and targets are all, are all known and defined a priori. Um, uh, we consider a minimum flyby distance of 1,000 kilometers and an instrument visibility radius of uh, 10,000 kilometers, which corresponds to about a two hour um, flyby. This particular analysis assumes that the object is perfectly spherical for the purposes of the visibility calculations, but that can be easily relaxed to include more uh, complicated visibility calculations as well. So uh, the example observation plan is shown as follows. So um, in the figure on the left, the open boxes show uh, windows in time in which the target uh, is observable. The, uh, the boxes in green show scheduled observation times, and the boxes in red show uh, times in which the space shop is performing an instrument slew, or sorry, um, instrument setup or spacecraft slew. The problem is solved through a conventional branch and bound solver that's been implemented in MATLAB, and the observation lengths and the setup times are chosen arbitrarily, are not important to the, um, to the algorithm itself. So in this case, the algorithm chose to observe, uh, as you can see, uh, uh, targets two and five at the expense of target three. And this is um, a, fa uh, a function of the relative priorities. So the completed uh, observation schedule is shown on, um, on the bottom. So now we ask what the computational cost of this algorithm is. So um, in these two figures, we show how the computational cost scales by the number of uh, targets. And while the observation interval computation time on the left scales linearly in the number of targets, on the right, the MILP scales quadratically approximately with the number of targets, um, which is OK because a branch and bound solver can be terminated suboptimally and still uh, return a feasible solution and the suboptimality is um, is known. So in summary, uh, multi-agent heterogeneous architectures are a potential solution to the challenges posed by ISO LPC exploration and autonomy is a key component in any one of these missions. Particularly, optimization-based activity scheduling could be a key component of that autonomy. In the future, we hope to include agile science, uh, sorry, um, active guidance and uh, heterogeneous capabilities and prioritize downlink into the formulation of the mixed integer linear program. Um, thanks for your attendance and I, um, I look forward to taking questions in person.